Is this the best monitor for hardcore console and PC gamers? The Asus ROG Swift PG32UQ features an HDMI 2.1 port. Woohoo! That means console gamers can benefit from 4K 120Hz, whilst PC gamers can benefit from 4K 144Hz or the factory overclock of 155Hz. Now, before you jump at it, it is worth considering that the monitor can be found for £850. So as a result, in this review, we're going to be seeing if it's actually worth its price tag. So to put it through its paces, I first off launched CSGO on PC, of course. And here I was able to test out for its response time and input lag. Now I would say, in terms of its response time, it is decent. It is worth bearing in mind that in terms of the overdrive settings that you might choose, the level 4 will result in potentially the best experience. The reason I say this is because on its maximum level 5 overdrive, what you'll find is quite a lot of inverse ghosting, which is not only noticeable in a game such as CSGO, which looks like a bit of a potato, but also more graphically intense games such as Destiny 2. As for input lag, the monitor is decent in this domain. While it doesn't quite compete with the likes of the previous Asus monitor that I reviewed, I do find that the input lag is still sufficient for hardcore competitive gaming. Now, is this a monitor I would personally choose for hardcore competitive gaming? No, one for its size, it's around 32 inch in terms of its display size, and also because 4K 144Hz doesn't quite make sense in a game like, such as CSGO. Now, elsewhere the monitor has ELMB mode, which is something that Asus kind of coins and also uses in order for you to, well, as the name might suggest, reduce motion blur. This will, of course, limit peak brightness, so it's worth bearing that in mind, and it should also be mentioned that ELMB mode can't be used at the same time as local dimming, so it's one or the other that you have to enable. But on the plus side, ELMB mode can be used in conjunction with Adaptive Sync, in other words AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync, which is one of its key selling points in comparison to some of its other competitors which can't use both technologies simultaneously. Now, would I personally use this monitor for competitive gaming as someone who's shoved over 2,000 hours on competitive Counter-Strike and has reviewed over 190 monitors? No, I would never see myself buying or recommending a 4K 144Hz or 155Hz monitor in the first place. For this reason, I would really much suggest looking at 1440p panels instead, or even 1080p panels, if your graphics card isn't that powerful. Now, I should point out that the difference between 144Hz and 155Hz, let alone, let's say if we went to 180Hz, is somewhat negligible. I don't really see even the point why Asus have actually included this through the OSD. Nevertheless, it is there for you to use, so you can use it, but I would be very hard pressed for you guys to actually tell the difference between 155Hz and 144Hz. Now, moving on from that, we have NVIDIA G-Sync and AMD FreeSync. Now, this was a little bit of a can of worms for me, but I'll try and summarize as quickly as possible. Now, I've got an RTX 2080 Super, I'm connected over DisplayPort, and therefore I can utilize DSC. For those people who are not sure about what that means, do check it down in the description below, there'll be more information as to what DSC DSC actually does. Now, with DSC and 144Hz, I was able to run the monitor in its max refresh rate, but while running G-Sync on the NVIDIA Pendulum demo, it would simply refuse to work. The only way I got the NVIDIA Pendulum demo to actually work with my setup was to lob the monitor at 120Hz or 110Hz. Although, again, to be mindful here, at 120Hz it was running 422 in terms of its color, depth and accuracy, and and whereas on 100Hz it was running 444, so full RGB. So in this respect, all I will say is that your mileage may vary. I did put it through its paces on Destiny 2 and CSGO, thanks to the useful input from Simon at TFT Central and Adam from PC Monitors, and in this respect I did find that the monitor was being capped in terms of its frames, and thus the pendulum demo might have just not been working at this refresh rate and resolution, or in terms of my setup. But at least in a game like Destiny 2, I did benefit from G-Sync, and therefore I incurred very much, well, no screen tearing and no extra input lag that V-Sync or traditional V-Sync would incur. Now on this note I should mention this does not have a built-in G-Sync module, it is G-Sync compatible and therefore it has an AMD FreeSync technology built in and as such if you're running it let's say on Xbox you're going to be able to utilize that FreeSync range and indeed for you to benefit from that tear-free gaming experience as well if you're on console. Now on the subject of Destiny 2 I should
should mention HDR, and here I was very much outstanding at the performance of this monitor. It does get to HDR 600 certification, I actually recorded 620 odd nits in terms of peak brightness, and indeed here, Destiny 2 does actually come to life with its HDR performance. In comparison to the previous Asus or AOC monitor that I'd reviewed which got to HDR 400 certification, this HDR 600 monitor really did bring the best out of what HDR is capable of. Indeed, you can go a little bit more than that from HDR 1000 or 1400, such as more expensive panels out there on the market, including from Asus themselves, but what I will say to most gamers, the HDR 600 certification and indeed its ability to get over to 600 nits makes the HDR gaming experience absolutely fantastic. Now before proceeding from the HDR section, I should also mention the local dimming. Now the local dimming is enabled if you want via the OSD, you can turn it on or off and I can confirm it's got 32 independent zones. So it doesn't have full array local dimming like more expensive panels out there on the market it, and therefore it means that you can notice the shift, specifically if you've got a very dark background and you've got, let's say, a white object, i.e. let's say a mouse cursor. Now in my case I actually found that local dimming was absolutely spectacular with HDR content. With SDR content it did actually brighten up the image as well, however your mileage may vary, you might want to disable it altogether, for example if you don't want that kind of blooming effect. Now the gaming performance of the monitor is pretty impressive, but what about how it looks like? Well the monitor has a 32 inch form factor, it's also got an IPS panel and it runs at 3840 times 2160 in other words 4K or at least not cinematic 4K. And indeed when I put it through my calibrator running its SRG me mode that was placed on the OSD, I was able to achieve 96.1% on the sRGB gamut coverage and 97.8% on the gamut volume. Here you can see that it does slightly better in terms of the warmer tones, but not as well on terms of the slightly colder tones. Now as for color accuracy, it's absolutely outstanding. An average delta of 0.97 and a maximum of 2.66, which makes it very much suitable for picture editing or video grading. However, there is a slight caveat and something that I've noted in previous Asus monitors as well, be it in its sRGB mode or not, its contrast ratio was pretty shocking. I had it re rated at 674 to 1, which is really not impressive for an IPS panel, namely for its price point. Now, I don't really know what the issue is over here. I know my calibrator does report contrast ratio a little bit under than other calibrators out there on the market, but nevertheless, just before recording this video and just a day before, I did a budget BenQ monitor and that had an IPS panel and it recorded 1055 to 1. So I did play around with a variety of different settings on this Asus monitor and also went through all different settings and ran my calibration report multiple of times and I didn't achieve anything more than 700 to 1. Now this brings me on to the peak brightness of the monitor and as I did mention before in terms of the HDR section it does reach 630 nits at least from what I recorded. Now in terms of its SDR performance in sRGB mode it reaches around 400 nits with a minimum of around 74 to 75 nits. As for user mode, in other words outside of sRGB mode it does go a little bit more than this or around to 430 nits. Now it's worth bearing in mind as I did point out before that ELMB mode does limit the peak brightness and it also gets you a little bit dimmer as well where the peak brightness is 130 nits and its minimum brightness is 81 nits. Now elsewhere you do also have dynamic dimming. Now while running on SDR I was able to record a maximum of 377 nits and a minimum of 71 nits. So of course this will change the brightness. Of course dynamic dimming will depend in terms of your content that you're watching so you might want to enable this if you want to see better black levels specifically if you're watching HDR content or gaming on HDR content it's definitely appreciated at least in my books if you're running on SDR content you might want to leave it disabled altogether but that's completely up to you see what your eyes prefer now moving swiftly on we get on to brightness uniformity and here the monitor does decent across the board it's not exactly spectacular nor is it bad, but in this respect for a monitor of its class it should be acceptable that a gaming monitor doesn't produce perfect brightness uniformity. As you'll be also able to see in terms of its backlight bleed, I noticed a little bit on the top corners and here of course will be dependent on panel lottery, so your panel might differ from mine in terms of it being better or potentially worse. So next up we get onto the OSD which is pretty comprehensive. As you can see over here you've got the overclocking option if you want to enable it, the variable overdrive which I did mention, so level 4 is what I would suggest, adaptive sync again if you want to enable it or disable it, 
ELMB mode, which you can see is enabled right now. If, however, I was to enable dynamic dimming, the ELMB mode would be completely grayed out. Now, as for the Game Plus mode, it is for certain um, inbuilt monitor functions, so for example, an FPS counter to show. Game Visual, I feel, should be actually towards with the image uh, section because this changes in terms of how the image quality looks like. In my case, I use user mode and or sRGB mode. As for Shadow Boost, I leave it off. And then going on to the image, ignore the brightness uh, because that's just for my camera to pick up, but of course you can adjust this depending on your uh, room's ambient light. Contrast, leave it as it is. HDR is disabled right now and it's greyed out because there's no HDR signal, but when you do have an HDR signal, you will have that ability. Vivid Pixel is almost like sharpness, so I'd leave that as default. Dynamic Dimming, as I just um, uh, mentioned before. As for AC, uh, ASCR, it's um, a adaptive kind of con contrast ratio booster by Asus. I leave that disabled, but of course you can enable that. And just before you say, no, this didn't um, affect any um, of the contrast ratio measurements that I had um, before. As for blue light filter, you can uh, have this enabled. You've got four different levels to choose from, which is nice to see. And then in terms of the color, you've got three different modes. So cool, normal, and warm. And then in my case, I use user mode with the RGB values left at default. Then you've got gamma and saturation as well. Input select is pretty self-explanatory, so is pip and pbb mode if it's something you use. Now as for the lighting effect, the aura sync or aura RGB, now if you want to have other um, Asus peripherals, you can have them sync around with the software and therefore enable or sync. In my case, the RGB lights are somewhat pointless. They're positioned at the top left hand side of the back of the monitor and they're not light enough for you to actually enjoy the RGB lights that come through. So I just think it's kind of a pointless inclusion, but seems to be a um, industry wide thing for monitor manufacturers to integrate a pointless RGB lights. But anyway, moving on to the sound, I was actually pretty disappointed by this. Be it in terms of its maximum level or its minimum vo level, the volume that was coming out of it was pretty low and in terms of the overall sound quality it was actually pretty shocking. I never used monitor speakers but given this monitor is poised towards console gamers who might not have a set of bookshelf speakers or certain setups, then I just find that the speakers should have been a little bit better, specifically for a monitor of its price. Then you've got DisplayPort Stream, which you'll probably want to leave on 1.4, and then you've got the DSC, which I did reference before in this um, uh, monitor review, and if you're on PC, you'll definitely want to enable it and therefore leave it on. Of course, your mileage may vary. And then in terms of information, where I got the RGB range and all that stuff before, in terms of the um, G-Sync uh, part, you can see all over here the information that you will attain um, when you are running on certain modes. So this is quite comprehensive for you to see. And of course, you can reset the monitor if you want as well. Now, finally, we get onto the build quality and the stand. And here, the monitor does look really nice. It's got that 32-inch form factor, as I've mentioned before. And here, it's got a three-side borderless design, which means it doesn't take too much space on your desk. Now, the stand itself has got a triangular type of look. So you might want to make sure it fits on your desk. In my case, it just about fits on the top shelf of my Freddy IKEA desk. Now elsewhere the monitor stand does provide height, tilt and pivot adjustment. It can't be fully swiveled, in other words can't be rotated and therefore you just have to be mindful of it. Although I can't really suspect many people will be wanting to use it in terms of its portrait mode. So ultimately should you buy this monitor? And first off we're going to talk for console gamers. Well it's got the HDMI 2.1 fabled port so therefore you can run 4K at 120Hz despite the monitor capping out at 155Hz. Now the monitor itself is really good. Its input lag is very good for you guys and specifically for its response time it's very much great for a 4k panel. Now you should also consider the fact that the monitor is pretty spenny at around 850 pounds. Is therefore the monitor going to be worth your purchase? Well if you've got the money then yes absolutely go for it. If however you want a better suggestion then you might want to consider a 1440p 144hz monitor instead and if you're even on PS5 one that will accept a 4k signal so therefore you can even downscale to a 1440p. Not only will this reduce the strain on your GPU, in other words, the one that's found within your console, but will allow you to output higher amounts of frames and therefore potentially achieve closer to that Fable 120 hertz that you're probably seeking to achieve with this 4K monitor. So what about for us guys who are on PC? Well, frankly, I don't really see the point of you getting this monitor, unless, however, you want HDR 600. So if you are playing HDR a lot and you want 4K 144 or 155 hertz, then yes, arguably this is the best monitor for you. If, however, you don't really care about HDR all too much, 
and you don't mind HDR 400, you should definitely consider the AOC alternative, which will be linked in the description below, which comes in at a much cheaper price tag. I think it's roughly 250 to 300 pounds cheaper than this Asus monitor, which just makes it a far better pick, and that money can be spent elsewhere, such as on gaming peripherals or speakers or a graphics card or something. So that's just my thoughts and opinions about this monitor. Hopefully this has covered everything you need to know, be it if you're a console gamer or a PC gamer, and if you've appreciated this detailed review definitely do drop a like and subscribe and hit that bell notification as it'd be greatly appreciated all right i've been totally dubbed take care of yourselves and goodbye